uh, uh, this morning's uh, sort of notes and uh, and that uh, initial model. My goal uh, right now is to uh, briefly um, reinforce uh, some of uh, the points made within the uh, glimpse of that model with an eye towards um, emphasizing the principles there. Um, and we're then going to, again, touch on and I, um, emphasizing the principles there. Um, and we're then going to, again, touch on, and I hope it will be just a sketch for each, um, two of the major system science traditions that are going to follow us through the week, namely system dynamics modeling and agent-based modeling. Both of these play special roles, um, each uh, in, in somewhat different uh, ways within the confluence of data science and, and system science. Um, uh, and uh, I feel it's important that we at least communicate uh, enough of the essentials that when you see a model later in the week, uh, whether it's a particle filtered aggregate model or if we're talking about um, uh, uniting Ethica data with agent-based models, you have some concept of what we're talking about in terms of these, um, these modeling traditions, these systems modeling traditions. So um, I have noted this morning the fact that we're grappling as a society and indeed as a globe with ever more complex uh, uh, health health challenges. And um, because I can only um, uh, go through these slides very quickly, I won't dwell on it, except to note that the types of challenges we're working with societally on the health front are in, in many ways more gnarly and more uh, tangled and uh, tricky than what, uh, what our ancestors um, had, to, had to deal with. And that reflects the fact of great progress on the health front, but also a very rapidly globalizing uh, uh, world uh, where we have air travel from one area of the world to the next, where uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, degradation due to uh, unconstrained development has has opened up contact with animal vectors um, that otherwise uh, were traditionally absent, um, uh, and where um, we're, we're facing the interaction of many, many diseases which were oft uh, considered in isolation. And I argued that complex systems are distinguished the fact that at a technical level, they're different than the, the sum of the parts. Um, uh, these systems are at a technical level non-linear. And what that means is that um, uh, the behavior uh, of the whole cannot merely be reduced to the, to the sum of, of the, for example, the, the, the parts within it, um, or of the uh, changes. If you, uh, if you intervene, for example, in two different ways in a system, you can't consider its response to one in isolation, the other in isolation, and just assume that its response to both at the same time will be the sum of those responses. Um, it's, uh, uh, these are systems which uh, often involve surprising behavior. Um, they, they react surprisingly to interventions in ways that blow back, uh, that cause unexpected effects, or simply dilute or defeat our interventions. Um, and uh, they react pervasively. So an intervention, for example, um, uh, to lower the frequency of prescription of opioids for chronic pain will have ramifications for police um, need to respond to overdoses or, or uh, impacts on the criminal justice system in terms of dealers or impacts on on the, uh, the corrections uh, population and the circulation of drugs and corrections. So there are tangled systems. A change in one place often leads to, to popping out of changes across the system and often in surprising ways. And often in, in these systems, the, the link between a cause and its effect is unclear. It's, it's often delayed, it's not immediate, it's distal, it occurs in some other area of the system. It's multifaceted, and often it's reciprocal, meaning it's there's a feedback in place. Um, 
So, you know, we, we intervene to help someone break out of a cycle of drug use and, and uh, there's a uh, concomitant ability to hold down, uh, a, a, an improved ability to hold down a job, which can allow them to get a, um, to get a home, makes them less likely to seek, um, uh, seek escape in the form of drugs, which can help further lift their life up. And there's a reciprocal relationship. Sometimes the reciprocal relationships are positive, sometimes they're adverse. But systems like this uh, are characterized by feedbacks that lead to reciprocal causality. Um, and uh, within these systems, um, uh, because we're dealing with unexpected responses to intervention, um, often they're very difficult to manage. Um, had any more time, I'd talk about uh, several examples of this. For example, our work with emergency department waits or, or opioid crisis. But regardless of area, and there's dozens if not hundreds that could be listed here, um, there's uh, one of the central challenges is, you know, where do we invest resources to achieve most effective change, to, to improve the situation, to, to bend the curve most effectively in lowering the burden of opioids opioid dependence or opioid overdoses uh, in terms of uh, uh, enhancing uh, the quality and the, the timeliness and the effectiveness of care. Where do we invest resources uh, for action? One of the challenges that I alluded to when we walked through the model was the fact that, that if we rely on our theorizing about an external real world situation in our head alone. Um, it's often very hard to understand the degree to which that theory is consistent with empirical observations, with observations from the world. It's gonna be a big point when we're talking about data science because it's all about observations from the world. And, and if we have a theory that's merely captured in our head, captured in a often in an inchoate sort of rough form in our head, it's hard to know whether it's consistent with, whether it jives with, or whether it's in tension with patterns in the world, because the implied dynamics, what we expect to come out of a complex theory is often not clear. We may find some data that we say, oh, helps undercut it, but other data we're not sure if it's consistent or not. Think about those patterns that emerge when we ran that model those patterns of association between, you know, the distance someone lived from a grocery store compared to a convenience store on the one hand and their weight, um, we wouldn't have known immediately what to expect from our theory if it was captured merely in our head. We might have posited there'll be some increasing relationship. We wouldn't have known what it looked like. It, and uh, this is one of the challenges when we reason in our head. And people have shown that even the most technical um, uh, technical of individuals um, uh, trained formally in all the mathematics involved, etc., are often extremely poor in going from a description of a situation to understanding what its behavior is over time. Um, what's even more troubling is that if we are not only seeking to dis to think about what what's going on now in an external situation, but we're thinking about interventions that we might put into place. If we're relying on informal reasoning, it's very hard in our head to figure out which of those interventions are most likely to be efficacious, how soon they'll see effect, the degree to which they'll be synergistic or dynergistic with, with other interventions, and uh, the set of consequences that they'll, um, they'll lead to. Uh, so re relying only on informal reasoning or indeed traditional statistics, um, generated from the past makes it very hard to reason about the impacts of an intervention in terms of how it changes things in the world. Um, the challenges of this are profound, are the, the results uh, of these challenges are profound. Um, uh, often we misperceive the situation in the world. We, we see a rising, very rapidly rising number of uh, case counts and we interpret it as a crisis of underlying epidemiology and only to find out it's actually a success in terms of greater amounts of reporting going on, for example. Um, 
we we may undertake a policy and we find that it fails it doesn't achieve nearly its impact or sometimes it achieves the opposite impact or you know we we find that that uh, a policy has entirely disproportionate impact on a group that's already benefited compared to a group that's not and when we're confused in these sort of ways we have challenges learning from experience coordinating with others deciding how to change the system best um, or what interventions to undertake. So system science is the science of a whole and, and a key element of it, not the only one we'll see this week, but a key one is, uh, is the use of dynamic models. And these models posit underlying patterns of processes in the, or underlying processes in the world that might explain um, how the how the uh, patterns that we do see from the world originate. So models, I had argued, can be viewed as kind of operationalized theory or dynamic hypotheses um, concerning what's going on out there in the world. It's not that they're guaranteed to be true, but by articulating them in a model, we can more quickly falsify our theorizing, falsify our, our, our hypotheses. Um, and critically, these models seek to posit, they seek to advance a working hypothesis about causal structure in the world. This is a very important point. I emphasize causal structure. What causes what in the world? We're, we're taking a stance um, about what we think might be the case there and testing whether it's consistent with evidence of the world. And the reason we focus on causal structure as opposed to merely associations is that because a major goal of these models is to allow us to reason about counterfactual situations which have never before been observed, where we change X and we want to know what are the changes in the rest of the system. And the issue is that if we merely were looking at the association between X and some observations in the world, that might change because of our change to the causal structure, the data generating process has changed. Associations might change. We saw that in the last model. We put in place an intervention, a change, and it changed the association. By capturing positive causal structure, we can, we, we seek to reason with greater confidence about what would change in terms of system behavior if we changed a certain thing, if you undertook, for example, an, an, a, a, a certain um, intervention, okay? Um, now, the ways in which we capture these, uh, this positive cost structure, are these dynamic models. And they come in several major forms. We're going to talk about two of them shortly, okay? So these models provide a way of examining the system-wide consequences of changes in one of the more areas of the system. So if we scatter supermarkets throughout Melbourne, as we did in the final, final moments of that last session, um, we can see the implications of those supermarkets on people's food-seeking choices, right? Where they go for food, the, the, the balance of their seeking of of, 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 of heads of lettuce versus Tim Tams. Um, at the same time, we could see the effects on their weight. These are the ripple through effects of this change in one place of the system, scattered supermarkets to other areas of the system, you know, weight and, and, and food seeking behavior, the larders they keep. Um, uh, within their, their homes in terms of the food they stored up, etc. Okay? Um, uh, and these sort of models are useful for many purposes, but they help us understand leverage points in the systems, the areas where we can intervene to greater effects or to have sooner effect, ways that we might change the system structure, and indeed ways that other parties within the system might, might work together. Now, uh, the um, the models here are, it's very important to realize, um, have a feature that's going to be absolutely central to the purposes of this boot camp. 
It's critical to understand that these models are lent to the term dynamic models, specifically because they track the resulting behavior of the system, the simulated system over time. We take this model, we articulate a theory, and then we say run, and it plays out the logical consequences of that theory over time. It's not just we're saying this is higher and it says that is lower. It's actually, how does it play out over time? We saw that before. Remember, we saw people going around seeking food in convenience stores, making use of grocery stores, changing weights over time. Remember, remember that person was ch changing weight? The system is playing out over time. There's an evolving, we say there's an evolving state of the system. The situation of the model evolves over time. As time moves forward, it, it evolves, okay? And basically we say, okay, given the current situation, this is what things are, how things are likely to change. We do that differently in agent-based models and, and system dynamics models, and it tells us the consequences of that over time. Critically, system behavior here is emergent. We're not specifying some imposed form that this model is going to have weight increasing as an exponential function over time. Rather, what comes out of it is a result of a complex nonlinear interaction of a bunch of factors. It is emergent. It is mathematically impossible to write down in so-called closed form, write down a formula that will describe the outputs of these models. Our current mathematics lacks an ability to to characterize the behavior of nonlinear systems in a, in a closed form. So the behavior here emerges over time. The one way to get at that behavior is to run a simulation of it. That's what we know to do. And um, at a logical level, um, uh, it, it, it follows uh, from the character of nonlinearity that we have to simulate it in this sort of way for many nonlinear, for, for most nonlinear systems. Um, and the models that we build often, like the systems in the world, have surprising behavior. Okay, now, models are always simplifications of the world. They're, they're, they're sort of simple mimics of the world. Um, they represent abstractions of the world. And one of the biggest features of abstractions um, is the fact they hide detail. And the fact that a model leaves out certain details is what makes it useful, what makes, what makes them useful. And the analogy I'd like to offer here is to maps. We deal all the time with maps, often now electronically, traditionally in paper. And it's the capacity to leave out detail that, particularly with paper maps, it's particularly obvious, right? If you sought to... Uh, know the biking trails around Saskatoon. You'd use a different app than you would for um, for trying to drive through town, or then indeed if you're trying to prevent brownouts in the electricity grid, you'd use a different map yet. Or if you're trying to prevent flooding along White Swan Drive, you'd use a different mo mo a map yet. Maps, like models, simplify the world for certain purposes and. For what purpose we're going to use a map shapes what information it includes and what it, what it leaves out, what it omits. And you could argue that all maps are wrong in the sense that they're an incomplete description of the world, but it's its very incompleteness that allows it to be useful. And so it is uh, with models. Um, and with models, we are building a simplified characterization of the world, which is when we build maps, and we're seeing what the logical consequences are. And often we are iterating as to what needs to be in there and, and what doesn't. So with models, there's this always a need to be asking what needs to be in there? How do we represent things? Does, does the model generate it or does the model just presuppose something? Um, uh, or does it leave it out altogether? Um, the analogy that I'd like to give here, and again, Great credit is due to uh, Jeff for serving as a shaper of much of my thinking in this area. Is is to replace uh, to replace a common misconception about models with another 
compelling, compelling analogy. It's sometimes viewed that simulation models, mistakenly viewed, that simulation models are aspire to be crystal balls. You peer into them and you see the future. Yeah, the, the idea is that, you know, people think of them as, okay, they're going to tell us what's going to happen next year and the year beyond and the year beyond. They, they aspire to tell us. And the, the truth here is that crystal balls like this are not, it's not fruitful to approach models from the perspective of crystal balls. There are stochastics in the world that your model are never going to include. Uh, whether it's stochastics about the weather of Saskatoon or stochastics involving hanging chads and voting, <laughs> voting in Florida um, or the, the ravings of, of political madmen. Um, <laughs> um, we're, you know, it's, it, there, there are stochastics in the world we're never going to be able to fully predict um, in a realistic moment. Um, and uh, within the course of modeling, it's a mistake to think that we're aspiring after a crystal ball that, that either is perfect in its predictions or is useless and should be, should be uh, shattered. Rather, models are best viewed as prostheses. This is Jeff's uh, beautiful term for it. Um, model is a prosthesis, though, not... Not, not in, the, in a physical sense, but in a mental sense. The idea behind a prosthesis, of course, is that when we have certain limitations, um, for example, when I broke my foot, um, uh, normally I'd, I'd be very limited in my ability to get around. In a prosthesis, whether it's a crutch or a boot or a, indeed an artificial leg, helps me compensate for my limitations. It helps me achieve close to full function despite my limitation, right? That's what we use prosthesis for, whether it's a prosthetic arm or a leg or what have you. And the view here is that models are thinking prosthesis. It's known from countless experiments that, that people have very limited ability to reason quantitatively in a reliable fashion about complex systems. And simulation models help us learn more quickly. They help us complement those limitations by allowing us to think through the consequences of our assumptions more consistently, quickly, and thoroughly than we would be able to otherwise. Okay. They allow us to, to, to think through what are the logical implications of this theory in a rigorous fashion very quickly. I mean, you, you run it out. Did you see that, right? We, we posited this theory. It was operationalized in a precise way. And we told the simulation software, hey, go figure. Go run this out over time in a way I never could. Einstein couldn't have, have done that. And it allows us to do it uh, in a more consistent way than we can in our head and a more reliable way. Because of that, it turns out we can make use of that empirical evidence. Um, uh, we can we can test the degree to which that consistency is consistent with the observed patterns of the world. Remember those associations we noted coming out of the model? We could say, does that jive with what we see? If it doesn't, what are we missing in the model? What 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 factors are we missing in the model? And it can inform our choices by allowing us to know, okay, which interventions are likely to yield the, the greatest gain. Um, and advancing our understanding. So the idea here is a learning process, something that complements our limitations, plays to our strengths in our, in our thinking, and allows us to learn more quickly, reliably, and thoroughly, and rigorously about the world. Now, this again is getting to the heart of our goals uh, with this boot camp, because so much of this boot camp is about empirical data from the world and enriching it and reasoning about it and inferring from it. This interface between the model and what we observe from the world is thus central to the goals of this boot camp. And so models are helping us iterate in our thinking and helping us to reason when, about the logical implications of our theorizing in the model. 
But they're allowing us to then make observations from the world and test the model in the crucible of empirical evidence. And thereby challenge the model and refine it. The model is not this thing that you know we want to prove correct and it's immutable. It's an evolving capturing of our thinking about the world and our often our collective thinking that allows us to capture our best guesses as to what are going on and to advance them quickly when new evidence comes out and to falsify them quickly when new lines of evidence come in. So, so here we're often undertaking actions, sometimes interventions in the world, making observations, challenging the model and advancing it, or otherwise informing the model by the, uh, these observations. Now, how does this come back to those limits? You may remember a slide like this I showed a few minutes ago, where I argued that, look, when we're, when we're relying on our informal reasoning, we don't have our prosthetic, you know, um, and we're trying to get around it. It's very difficult to reason through what are the consequences of our theory in our head and to test, hey, does this jive with the empirical evidence? But with the model, we have this model to go from this operationalized theory to the implied dynamic. We just run it. We say, oh, that's what comes out of that. That doesn't look at all like what I'm getting out of the world. I better go back and figure. I better change my theory. Does that, does that make sense, what I'm saying here? Um, similarly, when it comes to interventions, we don't know what, you know, how the interventions will affect things on the top of our head, but when we have a model that will let us play out these interventions in it, it will map from the intervention, the description of the world to what's implied, and we can test, is that what we want, and how similar is it to what we want from the world? So the quote here, relayed to me by Jeff, is a beautiful one, and it dates from the, uh, from the 1600s. Um, uh, Francis Bacon, who, who anticipated so much of uh, of, of the broad outlines of modern science, who commented what, what sounds like an outlandish book. Truth will emerge sooner from error than from confusion. And this sounds perverse, that somehow it's better to make an error than to be, you know, cool-headedly reserved in, in your conclusions. But what it's saying is basically this, the seven, uh, 17th century version of fail early, fail often. Look, take a stance, test something out, try, try advancing some idea, test it, and, and see what the result is, and then you've learned something. You, at least you fail forward. Maybe your idea proved incorrect, but you've learned something in the process, and you try again, you try again. This is what we do with models. The models are not imperfect. They're not these, these crystal balls which are immutable and and perfect or worthless, they are rather an involvement thing. So we have a systematic way of replacing confusion by learning, supporting theorizing about what's going on out there, and to to help us to help us learn. And these models have many goals. One of them is to ask what if questions. Another is to anticipate and understand trends. And we'll be seeing both of those in a big way in the model. In, in this week, but also learning faster from evidence and from interventions, okay? But I would note the very important role of just making explicit our assumptions so they can be shared. But when it comes to data science and its interface with system science, this aiding and learning, this what if goal, this anticipating trends and, and understanding them are absolutely central as, as well. So what are the system science model types that we deal with? Well, I'm going to hit on two very briefly. One of them is this technique known as, as system dynamics. Um, and um, this has a set of cognate techniques which variously go by uh, the names mathematical modeling, compartmental modeling, ordinary differential equation modeling, state, state equation modeling. Um, which go back in some form to the to the 1600s, um, but its applications in health really began in the opening decades of the, the 1900s. Um, 
And uh, it's a technique which um, uh, in its compartmental form and applications to infectious disease was inspired by complex patterns we see historically, say in, in childhood infectious diseases. Um, uh, system dynamics in its modern form really originated in the 1950s um, uh, and uh, has evolved in, in, in the subsequent decades in important ways and basically provides a way of, of uh, representing, visualizing, reasoning about, and managing feedback-based systems, um, systems that are marked by feedback and, and accumulation. And system dynamics includes uh, a set of qualitative methods as well as quantitative methods. Within this boot camp, our goals uh, lie more on the quantitative side. Um, and it focuses on feedbacks as fundamental shapers of behavior uh, accumulations um, and uh, has a very strong traditional emphasis on participatory processes. Um, now, uh, the fundamental components of system dynamics are what are known as stocks and flows. And, and my goal is not to teach you system dynamics here, but rather to get you at least you can read a diagram which you're going to use this notation and know roughly what they represent. So these boxes represent accumulations. They represent, the word is stocks. Another word that will be familiar to those from um, engineering background will be state variables of this system. These evolve over time. They capture the current situation of the system. Um, and uh, often they change uh, comparatively more slowly. There's a certain inertia uh, with them, but they capture the current situation in the system, and state state variables. Now, associated with those stocks um, and counterbalance with them are the other major element of system dynamics: flows. Flows are represent the verbs in the system while the stocks represent the nouns. Flows are sort of what's going on right now, the, chain, the rate of change uh, with respect to, say, things flowing into a stock or flowing out. So a stock might be your bank account, and the flow might be your day-to-day um, your -day earnings that are flowing into your bank account. Or a stock might be the number of people in the hospital, and a flow would be um, to be flow in for admissions and flow out for discharges, for example. Um, a stock might be the, pre the prevalent cases of diabetes and the flow in uh, is the number of new incident cases of diabetes, the number of new cases of diabetes. So the stock, if we froze things right now, we could ask how many people have diabetes right now. By contrast, uh, that's the, the value of the stocks. It's the current state of the system. Flows, uh, you always have to talk about measuring it over some period of time. So there's 100 people per month that are getting diabetes within Saskatchewan, okay? So flows are things changing over time that change the state of the system, whereas the state is, is just given by the, the, the stocks here, okay? Um, and it turns out that um, there's some mathematics to... Um, uh, two system dynamics models that um, is formalized in the form of, of what are called ordinary differential equations. Um, it can be formalized very precisely and rigorously using this fundamental building block of applied mathematics that I won't be getting into, but does play a role in many of the uh, of the examples. I'm just going to, and I, I really wanted to show a particular example. This is an example of a system dynamics model. And you'll see this model writ large in a couple of presentations, uh, presentations by Xiaoyan and presentations by Anahita. Um, here we have a population divided into a set of stocks. Remember the stocks? The boxes here represent people um, with a, um, uh, within the population who are in a certain category. And here we've actually divided the, category, the people in the population into categories. I, a sub, so a subscript I. So there's susceptible males and susceptible females. So their I would be either male or female. Okay, um, there'd be ex people who are infected, but not yet infectious. They're not infective, but they are exposed to the virus. So they've, say, uh, gotten infected with flu. 
Um, and so they're exposed males, exposed females, infected males and females, and recovered males and females. And individuals over time flow between these categories. As people get infected, they go from susceptible to exposed. As people complete a latent period, they go from exposed to infective. As they recover, they go from infected to recovered. And as they wane in their immunity, um, they go back to susceptible state. So this is an example of a systemic diagram. The flows here are things like uh, recovery, completing latency, waning of natural immunity, and infection. And the stocks are the number of people right now who are susceptible, or right now who are infected, or right now who are recovered. Okay? Um, you'll notice, critically, per that previous slide, the stocks at any one time determine the flow. So the number of new people getting infected, that I would argue that the number of people that are getting infected at any one time, the rate at which they are getting infected, like 10, whether it's no people per month versus 10 people per month versus 1,000 people per month, depends on certain of these stocks. What might that depend on? If you were thinking about the number of new people who might get infected in the next month, what, what current situation within this model might that depend on? The number of people that are what? I'll give you a hint. No one's going to get infected unless what? Someone is susceptible. So there have to be, so if there's lots and lots of susceptibles, that will make possible more infections than if there's no susceptibles. Similarly, the number of infections might be larger if, if there are not only lots of susceptibles, but lots of what? Infectives, okay? Okay, um, so if there's lots of people who are infected already and lots of susceptibles, it's just combustible, right? Because the, the infection can spread very readily from an infective to a, to a susceptible. So lots of those contacts going on. So in short, that's an example of a flow that depends on the value of the stock. Similarly, um, there ain't no one going to recover unless there's someone who's currently infected. There's no one infected. How could someone recover from fracture? Or how could people loot wane immunity if there's no one in a recovered state um, to, to be available for waning? So in general, this the flows here depend on how the system changes depending on its current state. That's really what this is saying. Um, the stocks determine the flows. The current state of the system is dictated by the number of people in each stock, dictates the rate of change seen with respect to um, uh, the, that, that state in the future. And similarly, the flows dictate the change of the stocks. The fact that lots of people are getting infected means people are flowing into the exposed state. It's rising if, if that number of new infections per month, say, is greater than the number that are completed latency per month. So the flows, in turn, dictate the evolution of the state. So in short, the system is evolving in a way that its, rate, its change depends on its current situation, and its current situation is in turn impacted by this change. System dynamics captures models of this form, and we'll see this a lot during the boot camp. These stocks represent the counts of people in each of these categories. Any, so I realize I've just touched on this. Any confusions about this diagram you want to have have, have discussed right now. These arrows, these indicate what depends on what. So for example, the prevalence of infection, a fraction of people that are infected depends on the number of total people infected plus the total population. Um, uh, and the number who are completing latency depends on the number who are exposed right now in the latent period. Um, that's how we, we write these dependencies, these kind of blue arrows. So this is one type of modeling we're going to be seeing. The boxes here are counts of people, in this case, in that category. Okay? Okay. We'll, we'll see this a lot. The other type of model I'll be talking about is an agent-based model. We already saw an agent-based model in this very room prior to the glycemic injection. Um, 
So agent-based models characterize one or more populations of individual actors or, or agents. And each of those agents is associated with certain characteristics. Um, they're associated with certain persistent characteristics. I like to call them parameters, properties. For, so for example, they might have a gender or an ethnicity, or they were born with a certain birth weight, or, or they, they have a certain income that's stable. Those are things that are more or less fixed. And then there's, there's a state of that person, their current situation. Aspects of state might include their age or whether they're currently a smoker or not, or their smoking status, how many friends they have, or, or their current weight, um, or their current height uh, for a child where it might be modifying, etc. So this reflects a potentially changing quantity. Oh, it is changing. It's an evolving aspect of the current situation. Then there are actions that change the state and rules to trigger those actions. Um, and they have a way of interacting critically with other agents. These agents are not characterized in an atomistic way that they're solitudes to one another. They interact. They interact with one another, say, by infecting one another, inspiring one another, or, or um, uh, communicating to one another, etc. So they're placed in an environment. The environment we saw earlier this morning with our agent-based model was a geographic one. In other cases, we might focus on people's social networks and their interactions there. Um, these actors are often people, but they could be organizations, say community organizations or, or, or larger, larger organizations. Um, uh, that, that might interact with other actors. You might have multiple populations, a population of organizations, a population of people, and a population of, of physicians, for example, um, interacting with each other. So these models depict things at a fine-grained individual level, and they can track longitudinally over time the behavior and decisions and context of an agent and their, their choices in light of that context. It has a certain time horizon and a certain initial state. So we might have something like this, ladies and gentlemen. So here's our, here's, here's our definition. We say in our theory of personhood, we say people have an ethnicity, sex, and income for the purposes of this model. And in the simulation, we have many particular people and each of them has some ethnicity, some sex, and some particular income. Mm -hmm. And that might be their properties, their parameters of that agent, their characteristics. Mm -hmm. And we'll have state. Their state changes over time. So maybe we have, we have individuals who have a, a state with respect to their infection, or susceptible, or exposed, or affected, or recovered. Um, and that's evolving over time. They get infected and they go to the exposed state and then they go through latency and they become infected. Here, each individual is tracking its own situation. We can keep track of their history or their, their biography, as it were, their trajectory. They might also have a state with respect to care seeking. Maybe they're not open to seeking care. Maybe, maybe um, this is an individual with TB who, who is worried that they're going to be uh, locked up if they discover they have TB, and um, uh, maybe they're at risk uh, of coming into contact with authorities and the law, and so they're not op open to seeking care. They're afraid to seek care for their TB because they'll be recognized as a lady of the night and locked up. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so they, they might be in a state with respect to that, perhaps through peer influence, they'd be open eventually to seeking care in a way that would drive them to care. So within agent-based models, each individual has some state. We saw this earlier in this very room where we had, where we had individuals had state. They had individual, they had a state with respect to whether they were in the supermarket or in transit to home 
or at home and not seeking food. They have state with respect to their weight over time. You may recognize this as, what sort of model is this up here? This is a system dynamics model, actually, with their weight being a stock and the flows in and out being energy in and energy out. So they have a state. That's actually a hybrid model there. Okay. Um, there's uh, means of interaction uh, with agents. So, um, so for example, here, the, the way in which, whoa, in our model, the way in which they interact uh, was through, they interact with the, with the um, environment. Um, they interact with the stores, for example, purchase things from the stores. And other models, they might uh, interact with each other in ways that inspire, in fact, et cetera. Um, Okay, I think I'll, I'll skip this. Um, but often we place these individuals in networks similar to, say, social networks. We might have multiple types of networks, a needle sharing network, a sexual contact network, and a friend and family network, for example. Um, and we have emergent behavior. Um, in system dynamics, the emergent behaviors are behaviors over time associated with the system. Ladies and gentlemen, here we have behaviors associated with uh, behavior over time for an agent or for the collective of agents, but also patterns over time or over space. So we have individuals, for example, circulating within a geographic region, such as our fair city, um, and uh, inducing patterns over space. This from a uh, model of... Um, of a prion-based disease in deer, uh, in mule deer within our province, showing, showing uh, the spatial patterning of where prions are concentrated as posited by the model um, due to um, uh, deer uh, excretion and carcasses, et cetera. So here are the spatial patterns that emerge from this model that were quite unexpected, but character, uh, emerge from the patterns of water seeking and food seeking by the deer and build up over time. Or we may have this model for LA showing um, residences in food stores in the women and infants and children program. In contrast to system dynamics, agent-based models are typically stochastic. They exhibit stochastics over time. Um, and what that means is we run the model many times over to, to ensure that our results are not merely flukes. And I'm not going to go into that uh, further. So I've taken a look at system science goals and um, two major traditions, system dynamics modeling and agent-based modeling in, um, uh, within the system science lens. Both of these have absolutely critical roles to play when it comes to intersecting with data science. There are things that Asian-based models are very well suited to when interacting with data science, and data science has amazing things it can bring to the table to inform Asian-based models and to take advantage of the fact that Asian-based models are articulated at an individual level, and therefore we can compare their data to corresponding data collected, say, via smartphones or wearables for individuals. System dynamics models provide us an exquisite tool for reasoning about the broad patterns that we see within the population in relating it particularly to aggregate data that we collect from the world. So when we collect data, say, from um, Twitter or from, um, from uh, search behaviors, or when we gather data from uh, emergency room waiting times, et cetera. Data that aren't at an individual level, but rather aggregate system dynamics models uh, provide us a real um, beautiful instrument to, to align with that data, to be grounded by that data, and to help us understand the implications of that data for, uh, for what it tells us about the broader system. They can help us take data on one piece of the system and and help us understand what it means about what's going on in the other areas of the system. System dynamics models, like agent-based models, have a unique 
role to play within the context of modern application intersections of data science and system science. But those are the two major types of system science methods that we're going to be drawing on this week. There is a third method that I'll often feature on other occasions, discrete event simulation. I'm not going to be focusing on that. That focuses on, um, on service delivery and defined workflows, um, QA behavior. Um, it has uh, potential intersections with system science, but because I'm not going to be drawing on it this week, uh, I won't be elaborating on it now. So we have just a few minutes. I promised Christine that um, I would uh, uh, I will uh, facilitate timely delivery of, of sustenance to uh, to your stomachs, um, and uh, and uh, I'm not going to stand in the way for that. She assures me the food will be uh, will be delivered uh, promptly at, at noon here. Are there any questions? I know you've seen a whirlwind of stuff here. Um, are there any questions I could answer about the techniques I've overviewed uh, before we break for lunch and then go on to, um, to aspects of uh, particular uh, big data sources for the afternoon? Are there any questions? Yes, yeah. Uh, just so I can kind of apply this to something in the um, so I, uh, I'm working on, a, I'm a public health researcher, and uh, so we're working on an, we have an intervention ready to go for trying to increase lobster and, and increase their use of, of life jackets. So, so, and some of the data that we have, for example, is we know where they stand in terms of their willingness to wear life jackets. It's the stages of change models. So, we, so would that be like their stop, like the count? If they were on the different stages, you could consider that to be like a stop. That, that's right. So, so there's actually two ways it could be articulated. You can think of that, and you know, to figure out which is best, we we'd want to talk more. But if we are articulating on an agent-based model, you can imagine each agent being at a certain point in the uh, stages of change, thinking about the need for behavior change in their life. And in fact, I'll, during lunch, I'll share a model with the group. Uh, in other words, I'll provide a model and mention it at the end of lunch that, that does exactly that. It has stages of change, trans-theoretical model, and you know you have, you have individuals, each of which is, with, is in a certain state of willingness to engage in lifestyle change for, in this case, hypertension. Um, uh, and so you can characterize it, and one of some of the approaches when we talked about this week might use empirical data that can help, um, you know, pin down where people likely are in that that state of, of willingness to change. From a system dynamics model, if you were thinking about a system dynamics model of this at an aggregate level. You might not be distinguishing particular individuals, but you'd be thinking about the community as a whole. Um, where are people likely to be right now? And how is it likely changing in response to the intervention? Um, how are we likely seeing uh, changes playing out in the community with respect to willingness to, um, um, to, to engage in safe uh, personal flotation device use? And, um, often we are dealing with data where directly going from the data to a complete understanding of, of what's going on is difficult because the data is noisy or it's imperfect or it's very qualitative and it's hard to pin down. And what some of the methods we'll be talking about will do is allow you to deal with that, that uncertainty in a mature way so you can still infer what's likely going on in the underlying situation that gives rise to that data. So that, that's what we'll talk about. And I'll see if I can come back to that example um, uh, while I mention it, just to, to try to bring it home. But yes, that's right. Yeah, other question. Yes. So that's really another example. Let's say we've been building models around suicidal behavior. In, in Australia, and you can think of it in both kind of ways. We might have individuals who are going from a state of thinking about suicide, planning suicide, attempting suicide, and including suicide. Um, but of course, you can also think about that negatively as well. 
can do that as a stock. So the total number of people in the population who are thinking about what total number of planet and so on. And it kind of depends on what your, your audience is and what your question is. If you're interested in how intervention might play out in a whole population, um, and the policy makers aren't really going to be, you know, they're not really going to be interested in the individuals. They just want to know where we put our resources, at which point in that, where in the population we put our resources to have the biggest impact to reduce the total number of suicide. But if you're interested in, like, you know, more sort of genius sort of questions around, you know, if, if you're a male with a low SES, with a, uh, uh, with a LGBTIQ background, and, yeah, I, I think that's a great example, and, and, uh, and particularly when your readings from a particular um, set of measurements may be maybe uncertain, um, but you've got a reason about that underlying situation that you believe is there, some of these methods might be particularly useful. I will note also, per Andrew's comments, is, is, is the, oh, the, dinner is served. the the goods are out there. Oh, it's okay. good. Okay, that's, that's, that's great. We'll, uh, we'll go for the, the passel of food and this yep. um, okay. so, um, uh So in addition to that, um, if you're interested in case management, for example, associated with, with, with suicidal ideation cases. Some of the techniques we'll be seeing tomorrow um, will provide actually a really excellent direct application of this issue of inferring suicidality on, you know, in, in the underlying person based on very imperfect, incomplete, um, spor uh, sporadic evidence. Um, and uh, could be applied as well in principle to the stages of change um, model, both for uh, blocks with the PFDs, and the personal flotation devices, or, or other areas. Okay, so I, I, I smell the goodies. Yes, and the, the salmon, or, sorry, the trout is in a separate area so that there is no, what do we want to say, contamination? Anyway, um, <laughs> so no contamination of the trout. <laughs> just so you know that. Um, so yeah, if everybody wants to just go out and start going through with plenty of vegetarian dishes if anybody is worried or wants to remain away from the Kalasa. All right. Enjoy, guys. Okay. So back at one? Back at one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And we're going to be diving in this afternoon to those uh, three areas of big data. Um, and uh, I'm going to be... Um, looking for people to be online for that. So if you haven't gotten connected yet, make sure you get connected over lunch because we're going to be needing to rely on that. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I... I uh,